بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد إن شاء الله جزاكم الله خير the community of Manchester for inviting us here to give these reminders for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sake may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us Allah ma'amin Today I want to talk about a very important topic to do with the role of the Muslim in rectifying and reforming the community. Islah al-Ummah, fixing and reforming our communities. As Muslims, we know our job isn't just to live comfortably and harmoniously with the people around us. No matter what country you're in, what city, or what time period. But we have a responsibility to go up and beyond, to fix and to reform, to correct the things that are happening which are wrong, and to bring benefit in place of those mistakes, and to create solutions to the problems around us. A lot of times as Muslims we become complacent in that when we find a place, whether it be this city or any other city, of comfort and ease, of opportunities, we just enjoy Alhamdulillah, it's in haram to enjoy those opportunities. But the mistake is that we don't contribute to the society in a way that's religious, moral, in a way that it uplifts the community. Whether it be having programs like this to invite the Muslims and the non-Muslims to hear about this beautiful religion of Islam. Or maybe helping the community become safer from the violence or the problems that might be there or offering services to the poor and the needy, whatever it may be. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came as a prophet, a messenger, he came first to rectify the people in their aqidah, their beliefs, by teaching the tawheed against the shirk that was widespread. And number two, he came to rectify the social ills of the community. We know at the time of Sahaba, before they became Muslim, alcohol was widespread. Uh, immodest dressing was widespread. Uh, oppression to the children was widespread, and all kinds of things you can imagine. So the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reforming inside and out, individually and in the mujtama'ah, the society. And I want to talk about that today in terms of what methodology the Qur'an and Sunnah give us to cause and to create that kind of reform. Because it's our duty, especially practicing Muslims, Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, the people of Sunnah, the congregation, the community, we have the responsibility more so. <coughs> You see, sometimes as a community, or might be led to believe it's the local council, or maybe the leaders who are going to fix everything. What do we do then? If we're not fixing, may Allah protect us from being those who are corrupting. And Allah says in the Quran, Allah, ya'lamu, ya'lamu nufsida min al-muslih. Allah, He knows best the mischief maker from the one who's a good doer. We have to muslihun, non mufsidun Rectifiers and reformers, not corruptors. Wherever you are. And it's important because if you look at each community, you find, mashallah, a community is there. Muslims are there. And we said, masjid is there. But then the question is now, how can we go from there to the wider public? So we're going to talk about some of those strategies and also give us some hope to get involved in our communities from the Quran and Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, the Prophet Shu'ayb alayhi salam, he said, وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُخَارِفُكُمْ إِلَى مَا أَنْهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ He said, I wish not to contradict you in that which I forbid you from. إِنْ أُرِيدُ إِلَّا لِسْلَاحَ مَا استطعت. I only want to des- I desire to reform, to fix and reform as much as I'm able to. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَى بِاللَّهِ My success only lies with Allah and my guidance is, can only come from Allah. عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَإِلَيْهِ أُنِيبَ in him I put my trust, in him I repent. Here, we learn a benefit. That he said, I only want to reform as much as I can. No one is telling anybody to fix the entire street. No, you start with what you can do. Maybe you're just around your house. Maybe inside your house first. You just do what you can. And everyone's capacity is different. But here, the scholars, they mentioned, rectiform, reforming them, what is it meant by this ayah when he said, "In uridu illa lislaha mastatat"? I only mastatat. I only want to reform as much as I'm capable. Imam Qurtubi in his tafsir he said, 
I don't, that is, I don't want to do except the action reform of your worldly life by bringing justice and your hereafter through worship. Pay attention both. Not just the deen. We're going to rectify your religion by teaching you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by me worshiping Allah. And also when it comes to dunyakum bil adil. Because we know the people of Shu'aib, what kind of corruption they were doing. Allah talks about they were cheating the people in business. You see? And they were, when they're doing the weighing, they're not weighing fairly. And we know in Surah Mutafifin, Weirul Mutafifin, Allah prohibited us as the same. So He came to reform both. It's a great benefit to teach us the da'wah of Islam is internal rectification reform. Your beliefs, your character, your morals, your values, and then your behavior and society's behavior. So from here, brothers and sisters, we take the benefit. We have to be involved in calling towards the good, everyone in his capacity. And we'll give some examples of what you can do to do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us the people of evil, they don't cause reform. They cause evil. وَلَا تُطِيعُوا Allah says وَلَا تُطِيعُوا أَمْرَ الْمُسْرِفِينَ الَّذِينَ يُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا يُسْلِحُونَ Allah says follow not the command of those who are mischief makers who make mischief in the land they reform not so there are people out there in this case it could be the chiefs and leaders at that time don't follow them who are doing evil because what happens in society we look to those who are ahead of us those who are authority and maybe if the people of authority are not following the straight path or crooked, we give ourselves the moral justification or license. Well, what am I supposed to do? Everybody's bad here. Right? Look at the look at the community. Is any better? No, the Muslims never like that. We're the ones who cause the reform. It's our job. If the other people are not, that's their business. Allah will hold them accountable. And we know it doesn't take a lot of people to cause the corruption in the community. If we go back to the story of the Prophet Salah and people Thamud, it only took a small group of people to kill the camel, the she camel, for them all to be punished except for the believers. Small group. It wasn't everyone did it. Small group and the rest paid the price. So sometimes we have to be honest that if we as a community are not trying to rectify as much as we can, each one is best, his best of his ability, you will find that the society will become worse and worse and we are at, on part of it. Because we're not reforming, and then we later complain our communities are bad. Let us move away, and we go somewhere else, and it's getting bad. Let's move. How are things going to get better if no one's reforming it, you see? And this now also not the right way. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he came, how time he came in, it was worse than you could ever imagine. As one hadith Miqdad mentioned, Allah ta'ala is the worst time period that will ever a prophet was sent, the most difficult time. And they challenged, took it head on. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sahaba, they changed the society. And this is what we hope for our communities. That the Muslims, whenever you see them, they're people of benefit. Here's a hadith to show us it's one of the qualities of Ahlul Sunnah Jama'at is Islah reform. That's why we're da'wah of Islah, Tawheed wa Sunnah. We're da'wah of Tawheed, to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Sunnah, but we're also da'wah to Islah. We call to reform. Abdullah Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala who mentions Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, In the Islam, a bada gharib and Masayyud, a kama bada gharib. Many of us, we know this hadith, Islam began as something strange, and it will return to being something strange. So give glad tidings of paradise for the strangers. In this version, it was said, who are they, O Rasulullah? He said, Those who rectify when the people are corrupt. Hadith Shaykh al authenticated in the Sahihah. And had number 1273. Scholars, they explain, what does it mean they are rectifying? What are they doing? Again, these are the Quraba. From the quality of Quraba, they had the tip, they're Muslihun, the reformers. Scholars, they say they reform themselves first. Then they reform others by telling them to hold on to the truth and bite on to the, according to the Mawatiti and the Sunnah and stay from corruption. But it can also extend further to any kinds of good. And if you look carefully, the da'wah of the Prophet's messengers, alayhim salam, they always came to their people when there was some kind of social issue that was there. Whether it was Shu'ayb's people, or Salih, or, or any other prophets, Nuh, they all have issues alongside the issues in Creed. So what we need to be conscious of is that a society we live in, we don't just focus on one side of Islam. We have to say we need a, a comprehensive da'wah. For example, we have classes to teach ourselves the deen. 
and then we do some community work for the Muslims and the beyond because it's part of our deen. When the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, what was the advice he was giving? Hey, Abdullah Salam, feed the people, right? He's telling them to feed the people. So it wasn't that he only came to the prayer, night prayer, that's part of the hadith, but he also said, Al-ta'imu ta'am, give the food, feed the people. And as soon as jama'ah, we have to be part of this. And the reason why I'm saying is because when people look to the Muslims, they look at us from more than one angle. What do you believe in? What do you do? Who are you? What do you teach? And what do you practice? So when they see people of khayr, or yusrihuna yafasid al-nas, rectifying when people are corrupted, of beliefs, of practices, not only does the da'wah become stronger, not only does da'wah look like for people, something now is not only something they can ascribe to, but something they can live by, because there's actions going on. The lay people who are not so curious about Islam will become more interested. But before we get to those kinds of things which comes to the actions, we have to start with insight. Because you can't fix a house, right? If the person who's built it or the one who's running it is no good. If you want to, want to fix something, you have to fix the people in it. So we have to start with the self. So our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't rectify the Sahaba by coming only or primarily just fixing the social ills. Social ills are secondary. First is the beliefs. And that's why Allah talks about how he rectified. He rectified their hearts. And unified their hearts. Allah says, you unified your hearts. Correct? Creed. And, and Brother Khafajr was talking about just a minute ago about the Suwadan that someone harbors in the heart while coming to their actions. Now, there's a very famous statement. Imam Malik, he said, and many of us, we know, it's actually taken from Imam Malik's teacher, Wahab bin Kaysan. So Imam Malik said it, before him his teacher said it. Wahab ibn Kaysan. What he said, Malik said, one day I sat down with Wahab, his teacher, and he used to sit in a gathering. And he would sit with us and he would not stand up until he would say, I'lamu, no. أَنَّهُ لَا يُسْلِحُ آخِرَ هَذِي الْأَمَرِ إِلَّا مَا أَصْلَحَ أَوَّلُهُ No, that the end affairs for the Muslims will never be reformed except we reform the earlier ones. And this is mentioned by Ibn, Ibn Abdul 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 Kitab al-Tamheed, authentic narration. And we know Malik, Rahmanullah, used to say it after him. So that's a principle. Nothing will rectify the Muslims and the communities except what rectified the earlier generation. How did the Sahaba get rectified? This is what's going to rectify us and reform us. So the benefit we take from this then is that we must analyze the reform of the past. Today, Muslims, when they get inspired to do reform, they get zealous and interested in this because it's an important topic. And then they have their own methodology. And then we don't see the fruits. Some will say, we must fix society by first getting into politics. And then when he gets into politics, nothing changes. Because he himself got busy now doing some politics, and there's nothing that changed. Or someone else may say, we need to perhaps do something like humanitarian effort, which is very important. But he doesn't focus on the fact that there's people who have bigger issues than hunger, which is that their hearts and souls are damaged. So he's feeding the people. And he's not, which is good, but there's nothing great more than that. That's a part of the solution. But you need to go from the roots all the way to the branches, not just the branches. So as a community, we also see the efforts of the Muslim not to belittle it. It's good across the world. But we also see their most authentic way of reform is what Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did and he taught. And that leads to the question, what led to the Sahaba's reform? Because if we're talking abstract, we need now something concrete. There is a hadith, Abdullah ibn Amr, he reports, Shaykh al-Bani, who authenticates in Sahih al-Jami'ah. When Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Salahu awwari hadhi al-ummah bi-zuhudi wal-yaqeen wa yahlaku akhiruha bil-bukhli wal-amal. That the reform for the first part of the ummah was due to asceticism, yani zuhud, being away from the dunya, number one, wal-yaqeen, certainty, number two. Two, not to say these are the only ingredients, but two important ingredients. Certainty and zuhud, asceticism. And the latter part of this ummah will be destroyed due to stinginess and hope, hopefulness. Amal is long hopes, to live long and to gain the dunya. So it's the opposite right, of these two. Commentators in the hadith analyzed what was intended by these two qualities. And they said the earlier generations were adorned with certainty and asceticism because they were also free of stinginess and hopefulness for the dunya. And at the end of times, the condition will be opposite 
And that's the way the people become destroyed. When you look carefully, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came to the Sahaba, the first thing he did was attach the hearts to the Jannah, not the dunya. That's the essence of zuhud. Zuhud doesn't mean poverty. And as some people say, that's the sunnah. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can test you with poverty. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want us to be poor necessarily. It's a test. And we know also the prophets and messengers came before us, men and they were poor. So there's no harm, no shame in that. It's a test. But if you say the argument zuhud is poverty is not correct. Zuhud means turning away from that which doesn't benefit you towards that which benefits you in the akhirah. The true zuhud is in the qalb. So zuhud means you can have a nice car, but you don't care tomorrow if it gets stolen. Because it's the dunya. It doesn't mean you have nothing. But zuhud is in your heart, jannah and akhirah. So the sahaba, when they came, the Rasulullah came to them, first thing he told them was, you do such and such, walaka jannah. That's how he did tarbiyah. For example, in the, the first group of sahaba who came from Medina, the Ansar, in the, in the first second, second treaty when they agreed to support Rasulullah in Medina, how did he get them to join Islam and to make him the leader? Because they offered this. He said, if you support me, you will have Jannah. And they said, okay. But today what happens, maybe because we're so busy with the dunya, or we want the dunya, we say, well, that case, you know how we're going to survive. No one's telling you not to have the share of the dunya. We're saying, put it in your hand, not your heart. Because the Sahaba, they had money. Brothers and sisters, many of us maybe don't know in our seerah and tarikh, the beginning of the da'wah of Islam was poverty. At the end, the Prophet's in life, after the battle of Khaybar, it was all, all richness. Umar mentions after the battle of Khaybar, we became so wealthy. Because they took all these lands and palm trees. They have money and rental properties. Money that makes money. Imagine land that produces its own money because the, the fruits are being sold. So they had money afterwards. But how come it didn't corrupt them? Because they had zuhud. That's the number one, the zuhud. And the second thing, which is yaqeen, certainty about the deen of Allah and the akhirah. This is why today in our communities, why Muslims may not be so strong is because of shubuhat, doubts that are brought to us. And the da'af, the weakness in yaqeen. Yaqeen is levels, certainties of levels. But we need to have knowledge to have yaqeen. Ilm, knowledge leads to yaqeen. So you need the knowledge, you have the certainty. Sahaba had yaqeen. They knew Jannah is real. 100%. There's no shak. And they lived in a life which they were dying, literally putting their life on the line to go to the akhirah. How did they have that level of yaqeen? Because the ilm was so strong in their hearts. Today we need to ask ourselves, the sahaba had zuhud, so we need to be more ascetic. But how do they have the yaqeen? The knowledge. Knowledge produces certainty. And asceticism is when you know that there's akhirah. You put everything in your hand and you use it for khair. You don't worry about the dunya. But brothers and sisters, when it comes to certainty... And it's a big issue too because, like I said, we've come to reform the community. We can't only focus on the branches, we need the foundations. What would make someone reform the community? What would make someone get up and do something extra for the society? Except that he wants a reward from Allah. Except that he believes in the akhirah. Maybe today, as Muslims, we say, we want to do something for our community. Let's make an Islamic school. Let us build, uh, you know, some kind of shelter for the poor and the needy. Let's clean the roads. And then we get lazy. Where is that coming from? The lack of yaqeen, maybe of the reward of Allah, maybe the ignorance, maybe the laziness. So we need to have certainty. Ask Allah, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al mu'afa. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told Hayy Abu Bakr, ask Allah for certainty and, and safety. فَإِنُّهُ لَمْ يُؤْتَى أَحَدٌ بَعْدِ الْيَقِينِ خَيْرًا مِنْ مِنْ مُعَافَى No one has been given after certainty anything better than safety and well-being. So we need to work on these two qualities and dispel the other qualities. See how the Prophet sallallahu attached the destruction of the ummah to qualities, which are two, al-bukhur wal-amal, stinginess and hopefulness, which are what qualities? Qualities of the heart and the soul and the body and the insides. He didn't attribute the ummah become destroyed because they don't have anything. Ummah become destroyed because they don't have enough resources. No, if you look around, brothers and sisters, all across the Muslim world, yes, there's poverty and wealth, but the resources are not necessarily the issue because maybe there's enough to go around. Maybe it's not distributed the way it could be in the best form, but we're not necessarily dying of that. What's changing, especially in these lands we're in, is what's inside of us. Because we came for the resources, Allah blessed us with it. And then what happened? It might have corroded the inside. So we're getting stingy now. Oh, like, Sadaqah, I can't give that. I need to make sure I pay my bills. Or you say, you know what? I shouldn't, I don't have to worry too much about the deen right now. I'll, I will live a long life. I'll make trouble when I get older. You know, that's why you find sometimes the youth, they're so busy in some nonsense. 
Because he tells himself, you know, when I get to the older age, I'll make the tawbah. Oh, too told you, too told you're going to live that long anyways. You know, we have to address, address these issues. Coming back to these two points now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since his messenger told us the solution to reform, we need to start by having those qualities and teaching them and pushing away the others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the time of Musa alayhi salam, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَحْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ Allah says, we made the children of Israel leaders and gave them guidance, etc. when they were patient with our affair, patient with the religion, patient with the commands of Allah, and they were certain about our verses. Certainty, knowledge breeds certainty, certainty, patience. So here we can also see that if you have yaqeen, and you have that knowledge, you're going to be patient in doing the work that it takes to fix the community. But lack of patience, lack of certainty, lack of knowledge, then there's not going to be a lot of reform happening. The Sahab and the Salaf, they really understood what life was about. So when we look at this point, we need to work on that aspect, especially here in the United Kingdom, in the UK, where the doubts are growing all across the country. Atheism, as far as the highest amongst the world, is in this country. Some state numbers, they mix them from 40 to 50% of people are atheists, and the consensus is not really there, or the census, because people don't openly speak about it. Imagine. People, that's how bad things are. So certainty is important in our deen, but also looking at the qualities that are going to guide us and give us that kind of firmness. To see how the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, used to be, within they themselves, they knew the Prophet sallallahu guidance is the best guidance. They didn't look for anything else. And they used to also criticize each other for not being the way that they used to be, ascetic. The money is with them, but it's not in their heart. Abdullah Amr al-As, one day he gave a, Amr al-As, one day he gave a khutbah. Shaykh Mukhtar authenticates in Sayyid Musnad. He said, مَا أَبْعَدَ هَدِيَكُمْ مِنْ هَدِي نَبِيُّكُمْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ He said, how far is your guidance, O people, has, has gone away from the guidance of Rasulullah صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ أَمَّا هُوَ فَكَانَ أَزْهَدَ النَّاسِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَأَمَّا أَنْتُمْ فَأَرْغَبُ النَّاسِ فِيهَا And he's talking to the next generation. He said, the Prophet ﷺ was the most ascetic man. He had the most zuhud, but you, you guys have the most desire for the, for the dunya. And again, no one misunderstand me. We're not saying that you don't work and take care of your family. Don't forget your share of the dunya. We're talking about that's all you have in your heart. Money, wealth, job. And remember, we, it's not like we're suffering from that. You know, look around our, all across the, the Western nations and the Muslim communities. We have lots of people who have money and wealth. Why, why do we have the problem still? Because that wasn't the solution. That wasn't the solution. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said one hadith, I'm not scared for you poverty, I'm scared for you wealth. Well, we got to remember that hadith all the time because what shaitan will come to you see poverty. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam worried for you wealth. Because what will lead to you next, and I mentioned, which is a stinginess. The stinginess, how do you get rid of that? Number one, you have to know that being stingy is a disease. If you get stingy, it's a disease. When you want to give, stinginess prevents you. The stinginess prevents you from living life. And the Arab say, al-Bakhil, ita'asha maratayn. The Bakhil, eats dinner twice. He's so, he's so cheap, he buys a cheap dinner, doesn't fill him up, buys a second one after. <laughs> but if he was generous, he buy a good one the first time. Or he buys a cheap clothes to save money, the rips, he has to buy a second one. So Bakhir is a disease, it's a disease. And it's in the head. But what does it mean, Bukhul? Stinginess, scholars explain, the one who doesn't spend his wealth in what is necessary, wags upon him and has haq on him. Ibn Qayyim said, that's the meaning of stingy. You have a haq on you, it's wajib, to give and provide for certain people, or you have to spend the money in a certain way, as the zakatists and other things like this, that you have to spend those angles. But if you withhold the rights of others, that's a stingy one. Not that you, you want to save your money, that's not stingy necessarily. But if you're saving your money against the expense of your family, for no reason, that's a stingy person, because they're, wasted. they're wasting their rights. So here we learn stinginess. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned as a disease. And whoever has this disease, it will ruin them and ruin society. Allah said, Those who are miser- miserers and who enjoy in the people of miseriness and who whomsoever turns away from Allah, then Allah is rich, worthy of praise. What's disease is more worse than miserness? It's a disease of the heart, it's a disease. 
So how do we get rid of that? We have to remember being generous, being giving, spending on our family and taking care of those who need to be taken care of, spending on the brothers even. One hadith Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, one of the best dinar you can give is dinar yunfiq ala sahibik. You give to your friend. There's a reason why Muslims we pay for each other. And I'm Muslim with the CIA say, oh, you guys, mashallah, you guys are special. What are you guys doing there? You're fighting when the, at, the, at the cashier? Yeah, because we know. If you give, for who you khalifa, Allah is going to give me more. But you guys, your bukhara is stingy. Why? Because you didn't understand that point. The aqidah is missing. So brothers and sisters, if we understand that, get, we have to move away from that. And it's also important to show that when you move from stinginess, what does it do for the community? Sadaqah is coming. You're spending khair. You're doing the things that requires to the community to be reformed. You know, we know as a community, things cost money. But for all of us, our hearts are clean. We have zuhad and no bukhur. But what's the, how are we going to help the community? Spend it, help it. One hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu attached this stinginess directly to the failure of the ummah. We know the hadith about the end of times when people will have certain qualities, the Prophet mentioned, the user's transaction, the ina, and he talked about holding on tales of the baqar. One riwayah, One riwayah, it says, if the people are stingy with the dinar dirham, then he continued. And it's important how it connected to the, the Prophet said that, that at the end of the hadith, then the, if this all happens, the ummah will be humiliated. Allahu Akbar. Look at the full circle. Humiliation connected to stinginess because stinginess is no good. It also gets us to the next one, which we have to stop. It's high hopes. Too much high hopes about the world. And it's not wrong to be aspire, aspiring. But what does it mean to have high hopes? High hopes is different than ulul himma, high aspiration. We're talking about somebody who is hoping to live very long, so he doesn't do anything today. Because tomorrow's will come, inshallah. When I get older and the community will get over this, and we're just thinking tomorrow, not today. So this corrupts the community as well. Because right now, if we got together as a community, and we say, let's do something about the problems, so we'll say, well, Tomorrow is another day, inshallah. We talk about it and nothing happens. That tomorrow would... Because we you know, in our hearts, at the end, the work that needs to be done today is hard. So the Prophet told us to also avoid that because we know the life of a person is less than their high hopes. Had al-amalu, the Prophet said, the Nabi said, he cut some lines on the ground and he said, had al-amal, wa had al-ajlu. This is the person's hopes and this is their life, man. Fabaynahuma huwa hakira. إِذَا جَاءَهُ الْخَطُّ الْأَقْرَبُ He said, this is the man's lifespan, and this is the, his high hopes. And he said, the, the, the high hopes, the longer line, the nearer line is his death. So you die, Muslims we, and people, they die before their hopes and for the future end. Brothers and sisters, if we think about what it means to have طول amal, Mima Sana'ani, he says, Rahimahullah, is when you turn away. High hopes makes you turn away from the fard, that's wajib. Fard, it's obligatory things upon you right now. Wa'ani tawbah. And from tawbah. Because if I know I'm going to live, live why should I repent today? Someone may say, what's the hell rush about? You know, we, should not, we don't have to rush to take our time. As if the things are not going to get worse. Every year things will get worse. And as soon as jama'ah, we understand these points, we also understand that reform comes from the inside out. And on top of this, brothers and sisters, is that we need to also do islah outside of ourselves only. Once we rectify ourselves by purifying our souls, understanding that we stay from stinginess and from and from miserliness and from and from high hopes, and we have certainty, we have uh, asceticism, then we come with more, we become more qualities. And also we start doing things. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi what's unique about his da'wah, and which makes our religion the ultimate solution to the problem of the world, is the Prophet Sallallahu is a practical example. Islam is pragmatic, practical, on top of the theory. It's practical. For example, in one narration in the Sunan, a man came to the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam complaining about poverty. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, do you have a cup or anything at home? He brought it, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took it, he auctioned it off and got two dirhams or two dinar. He told him, here, you hold this one and the second one go by and ax. The man went, he bought the axe, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put the stick and the axe together and said, here's the axe, go into the mountain, to the forest, and don't come back when, to me in a couple of weeks or some period. The man went to work, cutting the wood, made money, he has some money, next thing you know, no more property. He came back, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has money. Practical, jobs, helping people get a job. Today we come to someone and say, help me, help me, I'll make dua for you. And that, we, don't even, we don't even mean that anyways, most of the time, we're just saying that, so we just run away. 
see brother and sister, then we wonder what's going on, what happened to so and so. Oh, he got into he got into poverty, or he had a problem, then he got into debt, then he got into drugs, and uh, he mashallah, he's well help him. And then, but today you notice if our community, if someone comes to you and says, I need help, I had a sin of Muslim, because we reform the society. We teach the person the deen, hey, if you get any job, I can help you in that. Because you know when we're in we're brothers. We're also pragmatic when it comes to tarbiyah. Someone makes a mistake, we pull them to the side, we advise them in a nice way, we make sure that they learn. We don't want to advise them in a way that makes us look good and look, they make them look bad. Advice is supposed to reform. But brothers and sisters also think about the contributions of Islam to the non-Muslims. And this is what I want to end with. And when it comes to helping our community, it's reforming by doing what the Quran is going to teach us. But contributing physically, intellectually, like knowledge ways to our community. Teaching them. Cleaning the area. Producing safety. One non-Muslim, he did a study he found. If a Muslim lives in your neighborhood, homicide goes down. So now Muslim in Berkeley University, California. I did the study. Depending on how Muslim the area, the homicide rate is going down. Muslims are safe people. I know, and unfortunately, not everywhere we're safe. But we have to bring that to our community. But we're safe. We cause safety in the land. That's born. That's part of our deen. What we also can do as Muslims, we have to take a look at the things that are plaguing our community and tackle it. If, for example, let's say some of the non-Muslims are struggling, for example, with, with food insecurity, you know, we Muslims, we can give, we give, we're generous people. But we don't just give them the food, we also give them the food of the soul. They give them the food of the heart, it's in the deed. In Canada, where we come from, in one of our communities, the people, they line up, the non-Muslim and Muslims, for the food bank, out the door, like around like early morning. And the amount of people that come there, just to get to shop, or to get the food, you wonder, and you say, subhanAllah, how will... All these people are coming. They're hungry. A perfect time to also give them down. You put a leaf in there and say, here, take this. Muslims were known for our generosity. It brings people to Islam. And we also know that that's how other religions spread their faith. Islam teaches us that we do our best. But also, brothers and sisters, we correct the community by correcting the other misguided practices. Innovations, we have to move from our communities. Superstitions, we have to move from our, our communities. Bad cultures. No, not culture. Bad cultures. So some call it some culture, every culture has something which is not the best. Take that away. Keep the rest of it. We also have to correct our community and our youth by helping them to have identity, to love our deen and to love the religion of Islam. Because when they look at their community, they see the majority and we're the minority, they want to be like them. We have to make them want to be like us. Muslims in the past used to be role models and now Muslims used to look up to us because in every single aspect of life we were heroes. And to finish, because I don't want to go further and longer and longer, to show you how much Muslims were advanced, Shaykh al-Islam al in Jawab al-Sahih, the book where he refutes the Christians, one of the arguments he uses amongst the hundreds of arguments he presents, or dozens of arguments, he says, when it comes to the aspects of the dunya, even you guys are behind us in that angle. He said, our scientists are better than yours, our, we have more dunya than you. We have a deen, so deen produces this. You guys are behind in every angle. And he used that argument against him as, a, as like a side argument, that if Islam is better than you religiously, Practice the aqidah wise, and even had the dunya were better than you. Imagine he cites some examples and he said, argue that at that time that could have made. But today, obviously, it's a different time we're living now, so we have to also try our best as a community to uplift ourselves with the dunya education around us or whatever material we need to succeed our communities. And that way, we become self sufficient to benefit the people. Because obviously, if you have something to give, people are listening. And if you have something to offer, people want. But the first thing we need to focus on, we said, is the internal. The latter stage is other stuff. If we don't do that, as the Sunnah Jama'ah and the people's Sunnah, we can't necessarily expect a proper reform. I said before, some Muslims are doing the reform, but not the prophetic way. They're focusing on the other things, and they're not fixing people's hearts. Connect their hearts to Allah. See what happens next. See when people love Allah and they want the Akhirah. They're not so worried about the other things. The things will fall in place. And one more thing, the communal responsibility. One thing that Muslims should have is the feeling of responsibility. We are all responsible to do da'wah. We're all responsible for being good role models. They said, and I method us so. The Prophet said, there's no bad example amongst us. So when you're outside, out and about in the high street, someone sees you, Muslim, wearing thawb, a sister in Jilbab, they say, that's a good role model. Not doing any mukhalafat, no public violations. We're not doing anything that would say, look, that's not how we should be. We should be an example. We also, when they see us, we should be open people. Someone comes to say, can I ask you something? Can you help me? Say, yes, I'm here. What do you need? You want to find that direction? You want to go? And that's how people, they interact with Muslims. 
And when they see us like this, so people they watch from afar, then they get closer to us, then they some will become Muslim like that. Just from afar, they watch, you see how those people behave? They're clean, they're organized, or the mashallah, they're generous. They have so much good with them. And our society, especially this society, very welcoming to Muslims. So it's a benefit you have here. But brothers and sisters, there's communal responsibility. If everyone says the imam is going to do it, and everyone says the da'i will do it, the guy who comes out of town might do it. Then me and you have to ask yourself, what are we doing? You know, If you're not doing good, soon you're doing bad. And then sometimes you find inadvertently you're doing the corruption. You're the mufsid. And the imam's looking for the mufsid and he finds you. So what are you doing? It's like, oh, bye. I got myself into trouble. You're supposed to do the salah, you're doing the ifsad. And today we find that sometimes embarrassingly, the Muslims were trying to reform the community, we, we have not much to say because we're the ones contributing, sadly. And this is not a good look for Islam, the Muslims. In Europe, especially before Islam spread, right, to the other regions of, of Europe, when it came to Andalus, to Spain, and then it came to France, it never really reached in England the way until like big time like here. It never became a Muslim country, England. But in Andalus and France, people were loving Islam, becoming Muslim because of what they saw, all kinds of khair. They brought with them deen, dunya, trees. They brought business, everything Muslims they had. They said, these are the people of khair. Because they have dunya and deen. But the dunya was meaningless to them. It wasn't mean, meaningful to the way the deen is. But they understood that the deen leads us to ihsan, the dunya, or itqan, perfection. So brothers and sisters, salah is a very important topic for our youth, for our homes, for our wives, for our children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says the Prophet Zakariya alayhi salam. And because if you talk about household reform, you have to have everybody on the same page. وَأَسْنَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَةً Allah says the Prophet Zakariya alayhi salam, before he gave him Yahya, Allah says, we rectify his wife for him. For any mis- mistakes or anything that she had. He's a prophet. Allah fixed any mistakes she had. Both now righteous. Then he gives them Yahya. And who's Yahya alayhi salam? There's one hadith Shaykh Al-Bani mentions and scholars have been mentioned in the stories of the prophets that nobody committed a sin except for Yahya alayhi salam. They mentioned some rewire. Like this means that like he was the most, one of the most righteous people ever. ever. And he didn't live very long either. But what's unique about Yahya? Hasuran is one who is persuaded away from sins, worships Allah. He got the wahi at a young age, a child. The question we need to ask, how did Yahya came? Where did he come from? From a prophet, right? his father Zakaria, and from what? A righteous wife. When you rectify the home, you produce good results. Brother Fajr was mentioned to us about the fruits. The tree produces good fruits. A crooked tree is going to produce what? You know, for example, sometimes you want to straighten the, the child. You know, the, the, they say, you know, you can't get, get a straight shade if the tree is crooked. You know, if the tree is crooked, the shade's going to be no good. So it means that if your tree is corrupted, the Muslims they call poison fruit. That's what you're going to get. So even at home, if the parents are rectified, the outcome, their offspring. If say, let's say the community is rectified, then the neighborhood, the neighborhood is rectified, the entire half of the province like this. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot we can do, but also we have the tools. It's little bit by little bit, and we move away from some bad qualities, a lot of places better. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be the Muslihu and those who are reformers in our communities. Ala kitabi wa sunnah, wa la akhir da'wan, alhamdulillahi rabbin alameen.